Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we thank you for being a gracious and merciful and kind God, Lord, and uh, continuing to pour your mercy out on us every day. And Lord, as we come here this morning uh, seeking to, to hear from you, we pray that you would speak into our lives, that your word uh, would pierce our hearts. And in the midst of that, Lord, draw us closer to you. And God, we submit this time to you and pray that you would impact our lives. And Lord, at the end of this, that we would be closer to you with more faith and more trust in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm a little bit old, not really old. Some of y'all are really old. Me, I'm a little bit old. Um, and if you're really old, you know who you are. I don't need to point you out, Jason Gintz. Um, but some, some of you, are, but I'm a little bit old. And uh, being a little bit old, I, was, I grew up kind of the 80s and 90s. And there was a television program that I remember. And you, if you don't remember this, that's okay. They rebooted it in the early 2000s, and I don't think it made it for very long. Uh, it was called uh, The Circus of the Stars. And Circus of the Stars would be like kind of B-list celebrities. They were usually TV stars, and, and a lot of them were kind of the, the ones that were at one point uh, celebrities, but then they really weren't so much anymore, kind of like Dancing with the Stars is now. Um, they're you know, kind of where, where are the stars? There's people dancing, but none of them are stars. It was kind of like that, but Circus of the Stars. And at Circus of the Stars, what they would do is the supposed star who was there would have to engage in something that would be a circus activity. And so some of them would be clowns and do various things, and others, my favorite was always, the same with, with any circus, always the trapeze act. And that's the people, if you're not familiar with the circus, because you know, they got rid of the circuses a while ago because of the treatment of animals, but, but we would get circus, and people would get on the trapeze act, they'd hang out of the bar, and they'd swing, and they'd flop, and they'd fly. Woo! And they grabbed the other one, and people would catch them, and it would do that. That's what the circus was. And if you went to the circus, you saw a couple things. One is now people would tend to be strapped in. And so if they fell, they were kind of slowed down, and there was a safety net. And you wanted the safety net there. And if you watched the circus, the stars, they would show you they're practicing, and they were always strapped in, and they always had a safety net, and undoubtedly they fell. And that was the coolest part of watching their practice, because they'd fall, and then the safety net would catch them, and you say, oh, they're safe. That's great. I'm glad Scott Bayo's still okay. And so, but that's what it was. And I thought, boy, wouldn't it be nice if in life we just had like a safety net? Like we're strapped in and we can take the leaps that God calls us to take without any fear because we have a safety net. Well, God is a safety net. God provides that and he calls us to do things which are us hanging on the bar and he says, okay, let go, we're going to fly. And we say, no, because we forget we have a safety net. And it's important for us to remember that God is our safety net. And God points this out throughout Scripture in multiple places, but today we're going to see it in Abraham's life in Genesis chapter 15, where God identifies and reaffirms a covenant with Abram, but ultimately we see God provides himself as a safety net for Abram to quell some anxiety that he's feeling. If you have, some, if you have your Bibles with you, Turn to Genesis chapter 15, and we're going to pick up in verse 1. We'll read the entire chapter, and then we'll talk about what's going on here and see if we can make sense of this. Uh, beginning in verse 1, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir, your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought them all these things and cut them in half and laid each half over and against each the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, the dreadful and, dark, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. 
Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for four hundred years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterwards they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in, in a, the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and flaming torch passed between these pieces. And on that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadamonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gigashites, and the Jebusites." So we'll, we'll pause there and just kind of see if we can make sense of what is God doing in the midst of this. There's, there's really just a couple of sections, a couple of things to focus or we're going to focus in on. One is Abram's faith. And, and then the second is going to be God's provision and, and God's assurance. But Abram's faith is interesting. Is In the middle of this, or at the very beginning of this, in, in verses 5 and 6, it reads, and, and he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. And, and really what we're looking at there is, is Abram's righteousness is established based on his belief in God and based on his belief in what God is telling him. And, and for us, that's important because what we look at here is, is the salvation for us comes through faith. Right? We, we get that, okay, I'm saved by faith alone, there's nothing I can contribute to that. And we'll talk about that part in a second. But for Abram, we're seeing this as he believes God, and it's credited to him as righteousness. And what's interesting with that as we start to look at that is that Abram has a faith that God is going to follow through with what God has promised. So Abram looks at God and understands who God is, the presence of God, and, and identifies, okay, God is trustworthy in, in what he's promised, and he will follow through with this. And that's what's credited to him as righteousness. But the second part of that is we have to, I kind of have to ask, well, what's he believing in? He believes in God, but what's, what is happening here in this moment that he believes God? He's talk, God's talking to him about an offspring. Now, Abram has no kids. Right? We, we know that if you know anything about the story. That's why he says, listen, God, you've made this promise. I don't see how it's going to happen. Is this guy over here a part of my house? Is he going to be my heir? And the important part with that is that Abram has a lot of stuff. If we remember back through the storyline, he and Lot had to divide, had to split up because there was so much stuff that the land couldn't support them both. So Abram has all this stuff. He has servants. He has all of these things. And later on, we're going to find his wife has handmaidens and all this stuff. He's got a lot of stuff, but the one thing he wants is offspring. Now, we saw some offspring running around here earlier, and some of y'all thinking, no, that's a terrible idea, right? But that's all he wants. He wants offspring. And, and I, but we look at that and think, man, this is interesting because God wants that for him, and that's God's will. And what we find here is Abram's desires match God's will. How interesting that is, and that's counted to him as righteousness. He believes in God. His, his faith in God matches, and what he wants from God matches ultimately what God's design is for his life. It's interesting. We live in a, in a time where oftentimes we, we think of this, there's this, this misnomer, and it's usually in Western uh, churches is kind of where you find this. You don't find this in like third world churches because the idea of, uh, it's called prosperity gospel, which is if I pray for it, then I should get whatever the desires of my heart are, God's going to give to me. And, and it, you don't see that a lot in, in third world countries because of the desire of my heart is, you know, a car. It, they, they, that's not really a possibility there, right? And so we look at that and have to think maybe we've got this wrong. But it's built on a couple of false premises and a couple of, of mis, uh, taking uh, some scriptures out of, out of context. One of the things that Jesus says in Matthew uh, 7 is, or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? And, and often we can take these things and, and pervert them into something that they're not supposed to be. Well, if I want something, then I just go to God and ask him. A former pastor that was here, uh, that actually Dave Bessler, who had planted the church with me, um, he, he used to you show a video called, it was called the Trunk Monkey, and you may or may not have seen it, but the Trunk Monkey would be this monkey, you'd have your car, and you'd have a monkey in the back, and it was a chimpanzee, and he always had a, a tire iron or something, and if somebody's coming up to your door, and they're screaming at you, you hit the Trunk Monkey button. The hatch opens up, the Trunk Monkey comes out, bonks the guy on the head, and then the Trunk Monkey climbs back in the trunk. And, and so we, a lot of times we treat God like a trunk monkey. 
We got God in the back. I'm driving down the road. Hey, something, something happened here. I better hit the trunk monkey. And God comes out, bonks the trunk, the thing on the head. It goes back in the trunk. We don't have to deal with him anymore. That's not how it works. But we live life oftentimes like that. We live our prayers like that. We look at it and say, well, this is, I've got this faith in God. And, and so I, I, we live our lives in the capacity like that. But shouldn't the desires of our heart match God's desire and will in our lives? I'll share with you something I didn't share at the first service, mostly so I can embarrass my kids because I love that. That's, I live. I mean, we, if, you're, if you don't have kids, if, you, if you're like young and you're thinking, I want to have kids someday, one of the greatest joys for a parent, and I didn't realize this because my dad was such a jerk about it. It, it, it. I didn't realize how much fun he had just messing with me. It is so much, it's, it's a blight. It is the joy of parenthood. So you have a whole bunch of them because, man, it's just, I've got the next 18 years of messing with kids. I, I'm going to be stay young forever. But I digress. It wasn't always that way. I remember my wife and I, we'd talk about kids. She wanted four kids. Can you imagine four kids? Oh, that would be sweet. That's not very many. And I wanted two. We settled on three. We got ten. It was around four, I remember sitting, and God had shifted in our lives and, and changed because my desire was I wanted stuff, right? I, I got a master's in class, psych, I'm going to run a business, I'm going to do all this. I'm going to gather all the stuff I can. I'm going to have a nice big boat and a yacht, and we're going to go sailing, and if I want to fish, I'll fish, and I'll go and do all these things, and I'll just have it, and the kids will get in the way. And so well, we have three. Well, that's three is probably enough for anybody. Sitting on the couch in a chair in, there, in our bedroom, and I sitting there, with my wife and I'm kind of just going, "Hey, I had something to talk about," which is never good, right? If you have a spouse, you know, if, if they say that, something heavy is coming. And I look at her and I, I tell her, "I feel like God is saying we need to let Him control the number of kids we have." And I kid you not, she says, "Oh no, <laughs> that's the same thing I feel like He's been saying." which now we're in real trouble. This is how you have 10 kids, by the way. You listen to God, and boom, all of a sudden, there's 10 kids show up. But the desire has shifted. No longer wanted the boat, no longer needed the money. No, It was because of God shifting. The more we followed after God, the more he shifted what our desires were. The desires of our heart began to reflect his desire. Now we'll fast forward. I got 10 kids. I'm sitting at the car shop getting a car for my wife, and I'm sitting there across from the guy doing finance, and he's got one daughter, and he's going to have a second daughter. And he says, you have kids? And I says, yeah, I do. <laughs> and he says, oh, how many do you have? I says, I have 10 kids. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and I, he looks at me and says, I don't understand how I, I've got one daughter and we're going to have a second. I just don't think I have enough love. And I looked at that and I thought, man, you don't get it. It's exponential. And I wouldn't know that had I not followed, had I not listened to God. Ex exponential. I had one son, and I realized, man, we jacked up. Something's wrong. Let's have another one. <laughs> and then we, we got the first three, and, we, and God said something's wrong with all of them, so we got duplicates. And there's something wrong with them, so we got more. But, but you, what happens is exponential. There's all this extra love. And so he's, how can we love something so much? And then the next one comes along. And there's all this other love. And there's more and more and more. Why? Because we believed God. And we allowed him to change our desires so our desires matched his will. So you look at this with Abram, and Abram's desires align with God's design. And God assures him, listen, this is going to happen. Don't sweat it. I'm God. I got you covered. You're just hanging on the trapeze. I'm your safety strap. I got everything. Don't worry about it. Just take the, take the leap. That brings us to sort of the second thing that we can kind of see here with Abram is what does his faith cause him to do? With Abram, it's interesting because we don't see this big giant act here. Later on with his life, and we're going to read about it uh, in, in Hebrews or in uh, James's. Uh, account of, of Abram's righteousness, but, but we don't see it yet. He has to do, there's a major act in Abram's life of where he is, is called to offer up his son. But in this moment, there's a small act of obedience that Abram has to do. You see, he's having these doubts, and, and he says to God, how, how do I know this? And God says, go gather these things. Now, I have to think that morning when Abram woke up, he didn't think, you know what, I'm going to get a heifer, a female goat, a ram, and all this. I'm going to just cut them in half and set them out. 
Why does he do that? Because God said to do it. That's the whole reason. His faith leads to actions. And his, and his faith leads to, it changes his behavior to such an extent where he follows after what God has called him to do. And it's interesting because we live in, in a time, and, and this is where I may offend uh, some of you, which is, even makes it better. Um, we live in a, in a time frame where historically there has been this misnomer of if you say this prayer, you will be saved. And I think we have a lot of people who said a prayer that may not be walking around saved. Because I look at this and I think, what does it look like if I have this belief in God and I put my faith and my hope in Him, what changes? Well, my actions should thereby reflect that belief. My actions should shift to such an extent that it's evidence for everybody. That they look and say, no, that person, they have faith. I can tell because it's in their actions. But what I see us, a lot of us have is a confession of faith with our mouth and a life of actions and behavior that completely contradict that profession of faith. And so what we look at here with Abram is his faith gets put in action and his actions reflect his faith. James puts it this way. Oh, I'm, I'm way off here. James puts it this way. What good is it, my brother, if someone says he has faith but has, does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. If you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. What James is saying and not saying is he's not saying you're saved by your works. But what is being said is your faith should lead to action. That action should be reflected and refle reflect the faith that you have in the one you profess to have faith in. And so when we look at this, we have to understand that, that ultimately the desires of my heart will start to reflect the desires of, of God and God's will in my life, and that will impact my actions so others now can see the testimony alive. But what we do is a great disservice by professing with you, God will give you the desires of your heart, and we fail to acknowledge the first part of Psalm 37.4. You see, the first part of Psalm 37.4 reads this, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. If I delight myself in the Lord, guess what? The desires of my heart reflect that delight. And ultimately, ultimately, my actions begin to go in that direction. But what's interesting with this is we consider Abram and, and uh, this situation, and the, this is, is, is a very small step that he has to take. In Hebrews, we read of massive steps and massive things that are conquered when we read in uh, Hebrews 11. And what more shall I say, for time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of da David, of, and Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. What's interesting with this is I look at that and I think, man, that's the faith that I want, right? I want to shut the mouths of lions. Like, put me in the lion's den, God. And then I realize, whoo, wait a minute. And the lion's in the lion's den. Don't put me in there. That's one for Cyril. Put Cyril in the lion's den, God. Let's see what faith he has. But we look at this and we think this faith is this massive steps, right? I've got to take these huge leaps, and we're on the trapeze, and we're swinging, and God says, just let go. It's not that far. God said to Abram, go gather these animals. I'm going to show you something. I'm going to answer your prayer. I'm going to show you something. And what does Abram do? His actions reflect, okay, God, I trust you. I'll do this. 
I've told this story before of my call to be a pastor. And it was, I, I can take you right to the spot if you haven't heard it, I could, it was a Calvary Chapel, and, and I, just to be brutally honest, I still smelled like booze from the night before. And I, I'm sitting at church, I'd committed my life to Christ, I still had some baggage that I was carrying like we all do, we come into church, we got our bags, we set them down, hope nobody sees them, right? And that was me, but yeah, I come in and you can smell it, oh my gosh, that guy's got some baggage. And I come in and I'm sitting there, and, and I, I remember the moment as the pastor's preaching and I'm praying and, and, and I'm doing this, and, and I remember remember the moment that God said, I'm going to have you do that. And I remember thinking, ain't no way. You can't get me from here to there. That's not going to happen. But then I also said, I remember this distinctly, God, I will do whatever you tell me to do. And my wife and I then began to volunteer in children's ministry, which if you want to be trained to be a pastor, that's a great place to start. If you can get kids to pay attention for five minutes, you are phenomenal. And so, but, but that's, it was, God, I'm just going to do whatever you ask me. I have no idea how you're going to do that. I even doubt, God, that you could do it. But I'm going to do whatever you say. Abram has his doubts. That's the whole premise of this entire section. Abram is doubting. It opens with God talking about Abram's fears. It opens with God addressing and dealing the fears that Abram has. Don't fear. I'm your shield. I've got you. I'm the safety harness, Abram. Don't fear. I've told you what I'm going to do. Don't worry about it. Which is always nice, right, when you're struggling with something and a Christian says, just don't worry about it. What are you talking about? But Abram has this fear. He has this doubt. One of the things we often fail to acknowledge is, is saints because it's almost unsaintly, right, to say, I have doubts. You know, I, how, how in the world could I have doubts about anything? Now, now let me be careful where I go with that. I have zero doubts that God is gracious and merciful. I have zero doubts that God paid the price for my sins. I have zero doubts that Jesus died on the cross, uh, was buried in the grave, was resurrected and ascended and sits at the right hand of God and he will come back. I have zero doubts about any of that. But I had doubts as how do you take me from the pew to put me in the pulpit, God, because I don't see it. And many of us, God has called in our lives to do one thing or another. We look and say, God, there's no way. Abram's there. God, I don't, have any, I don't have an heir. I'm an old man. My wife is an old woman. How is this going to happen? Maybe this is, a, maybe, maybe you know, God, you got it wrong, and maybe there's something, that's, is it really going to be the heir in my home? Is that, is that what's going to happen here? And God, you promised this land. I, I, what, how do we do that? What's that going to, what does that look like? The doubt is not in who God is or the promise even that God has. The doubt is in God. How do you go from here to there? Because I don't see that. Here to there is the moment you let go. You're the trapeze artist. And you're going here to there. And you're here and God says, let go now. And you say, nope. Okay, let go now. Nope. And finally, you get to a point, and you say, he says, let go now, and you let go, and it's just, boop. Oh, that was really quick. And you realize he's the gap right there, right? He's got you harnessed up, and he's not going to let you fall. And if you do fall, so what? There's a safety net. And if the safety net fails, and you fall, and you crash, and you die, guess what? Now you're face-to-face -face with Christ in eternity in heaven. So it all works out well. Let go. That's how it works. We have nothing to fear. Woo! And, and so we swing on the trapeze. And some of you have seen these guys be people with faith. And they're swinging. Woo! -hoo -hoo! We're letting go, doing flippity doos, landing over here. And it got one hand. Ah, I barely got it. I got it. This is great. And they're enjoying the ride. Man, I wish I had faith like that. How do they have faith like that? Because they understand God's safety net. And they looked at it and said, God, I know you have promised this. Some of us, it's just, I just got to let go for a little bit. Here's a guarantee that I can give you. If God's calling you to do something, and he has put this on your heart, God, and he said, listen, and you're scared, right? Because every step that we take sometimes in faith is like this. <sighs> By the time you get to the other side, you'll look back and realize, oh, that was a small step. That wasn't that big a deal. And the next one's going to be bigger. And he's, ah, and you remember that, and it builds on it. But God assures you the whole way. Abram is experiencing fear. God gives him assurance of who he is and what he has called him to do and what he, is, what he has promised him. See, God restates the promise. 
He starts with, with restating this and deals with his fear, and then he restates the promises that he has made to him. Anytime God repeats something in Scripture, we know it's important. And if you were with us at the beginning of this series in, Ge- in Genesis 12, I said, ah, I'm not, I didn't really want to address the full covenant then, but I felt like God had said to do it because I knew it was coming again. And guess what? It's coming again. God's repeating this covenant. Why? Because he's repeating it so that Abram is assured, but then also later on we're going to find out so the Israelites are assured. God's repeating this for assurance. Now, I know many of you would never guess this, and, and in fact, some of you will probably argue against me on this. I tend to be emotional. And with that, I tend to get angry. Now, I know most of you would think, absolutely not, Steve. I can't see it, right? But I will get angry, and once in a while, something will pop. Usually, it has to do with a little kid in my house. And because kids figure it out quickly. Hey, watch Dad. He could, his head will pop off if we do this. <laughs> and they think it's fantastic. And I have a friend who's a chaplain. And he said to me, Steve, it seems like you might have something going on here. You've you got to calm down. And I said, I, I, I would. He said, would you meditate? And I go, what are you, some kind of weirdo? That's for them weird transcendental meditate. What is this? Get out of here. He said, it's in the Bible, Steve. I said, I know it's in the Bible. I don't know what to do. He said, I tell you what. Do this. Take a deep breath. I take a deep breath. He says, repeat this. Be still and know that I am God. All right. Be still and know that I am God. Nothing worked. It's now. You're going to drop a word off that every time. Okay. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know that I. Be still and know that. You go all the way down. Don't fall asleep. All the way down, you end up with be still and be. That repetition reminds you, God is who he says he is. God is there, be still. I got this covered. I'm your safety net. And I can't tell you how often I use that. People have no idea what I'm doing. I'll be sitting there breathing, (sighs) saying that in my head, repeating, I know who you are, God. I know your promise. And it comes in very handy when you're at a football game. (laughs) And your son is on varsity. And he is a defensive lineman that nobody can stop. And you look at it, it's like he's getting back there and he's destroying. He's like hurting kids in the back. It's, it's awesome. He's like, yeah. And he's throwing people down, giving them concussions. And you're like, that's my boy. Because that's really, I mean, every dad, that's what you want. Just go and just break his arms. Do something. It's awesome. And you just, ah. And then he's done it so well that the coach on the other team just tells the kid on the offensive line, just hold him. Which, if you've ever played your offensive line, you can't hold on to somebody like that. It's holding. And you're in the stands, and you're watching, and they've wrapped him up, and they're, like, tackling him. And you're waiting for the flags, and there's no flags, and your anxiety's going up, and you're about to yell something that you know you shouldn't yell, but it's on the edge of your mouth. <sighs> Be still and know that I am God, because I'm going to kill somebody. <laughs> Repetition. God repeats his promise. He repeats the promise to us. Repetition of God's word in our lives will quell this anxiety, reduce the fear, allow us to refocus, allow us to be established on, okay, God, I know who you are. I know the safety net's there. I know I can let go of this. As we move forward, we see as that transpires and we start to look at that, what does that mean for us? Okay, I've refocused. Okay, God, I get it. And it allows us to get back to what our job actually is. Now, as a parent, I, I, I believe wholeheartedly that you have a significant job with your child, the, the number one job for, for every parent, especially, and I, I usually use this for dads, but especially for dads, is you should be able to ask your kid, what is my job? And they should be able to say, keep me safe. Right? That's, that's what, I think, one of the number one jobs for dads. So when my kids were growing up, the younger ones, I, I said, what's my job? Keep me safe. And their job, they have a job, too. It's not just a one-way street. The kid's job is, okay, it's, what's my job? Keep me safe. What's your job? To do whatever you tell me to do. Because in, in, in sometimes it would be, you need to do that because right now you need to be kept safe from me. And so we, it's a two-way street. And so we look at it and say, okay, what's your job? It's the same thing with God. God, I know you're God. Steve, what's your job? To do whatever you tell me to do. 
how much easier it is. God refocuses you, gives you the purpose. Do whatever I said, because it's going to work out wonderfully for you. Have 10 kids, Steve. It'll be great. 10 kids is awesome, by the way. I love three of them. <laughs> the other seven, I think, are transplants from somebody else. And then what God does in this moment, we might, we might miss what God is transpiring here. Abram has cut this stuff up. He's got it separated. At that time frame, what would happen is if two people made a covenant, they would walk through this. They'd hold hands, and, and ultimately it's basically they're notarizing. They're putting their signature on it and notarizing. Now they're bound. And it's been bound in blood and in life, and so that's it. What you may not pick up in is God is the only one walking through this. This is a covenant that God is making to Abram and to the nation of Israel this promise, and God is the one responsible to do it. Everything is on God's shoulders on this. Abram has nothing to do other than really just obey and watch it unfold. Now, that's important for us because what we look at and what we may not grasp is when I preach, a lot of times I try to get us to think of it in terms of what's going on at that time in their minds, and with this is what's going on in the mind of Abram, we look at that, but what we don't often think of is this is being written down by Moses at a later time. This has been handed down, and, and it's one of those things that the, the nation of Israel, they're much better at, I almost feel like I need obligated to explain this. They don't have Google to look stuff up. What was that again? Google it. They had to memorize stuff and remember it, so when they tra transferred stuff down, it was accurate. So Moses then, when they're in the wand they're wandering around, and they're going through, the, and he's pinning this stuff down, oh yeah, we're writing the, for the Pentateuch. And, and for our purposes today, we'll just leave it at Moses wrote it. Um, there's some tweaks in there that I'd have to add in if we were going a little deeper. But for today, we'll just say, identify, Moses wrote it. And so he pinned it down. I want you to think of this now. Moses is writing this stuff down, a prophecy that God has given about not only the offspring, but also the land. They're saying, wait a minute, this is us. This is the promise that God has made to us. We're the, we were the ones that were in captivity. We're the ones that left. We're the ones that are now being able to go into the land. How much encouragement should that be? Now, if you know the rest of the story, you know that it wasn't enough encouragement because they looked in the land. We're like grasshoppers. They're giants. And none of that generation got to go in except for Joshua and Caleb because they're the ones that came back and said, God said to go take it. It's ours. Let's go get it which sets up the book of Joshua. If you've ever read the book of Joshua, if you're a guy, you have to read the book of Joshua. God's throwing like hailstones and killing people. It's awesome. It's war, and it's, it's the cool book. If you want war and, and all this carnage, man, God's just wiping people out because he gave them the option. Get out. No. Well, then you have to be a part. No. Poof, you're dead. He's God, right? That's how it works. Do what you do. I said, no. Poof. No. It's, that's more the Catholic part of me. Come on. Do what he says, or he's going to kill you right where you're sitting. That's not how it works. But we look at this and, and recognize that they, did, they didn't get it. But imagine, oftentimes I think, man, what would it have been like to live in biblical times, to walk with Jesus? We'd stand there with Jesus is there, and he's walking on water. We're like, wow, this is cool. All these prophecies are being fulfilled. And, and here these people are coming out of captivity in Egypt. And like, yes, this is awesome. And we just look at this, and how great it would be to live in biblical times. You are. It is amazing to know what's happening right now in the history of what God has foretold. Amen. Did you know? I need to get to my notes here. I'm only going to give us a couple because I could spend all day going through this. I, actually, the, the, I mentioned Calvary Chapel. Um, I don't know if they still do this, but they used to do a prophecy update uh, kind of thing every January 1st. And, and he would, it was three hours long. And it was just the events of that year that fulfilled prophecy and pointed into where we were. And this goes back several years ago. And every year he said, I just have too much data. I can't pare it into three hours. It's, it would take... So I'm just going to give us just a snippet of a few things. Uh, you've, if you've been here any length of time, you know myself, Bill, uh, Cyril, we've all preached and talked about uh, the, the establishment of the nation of Israel is significant. In 1948, they, all of a sudden, boom, there's Israel. It wasn't there. A day before, now it's there. A nation born in a day. That's crazy. It doesn't happen, but it did. Not only that, but they saved their language, which is also a fulfillment of prophecy. They still speak Hebrew. It was thought to be a dead language. They still speak it. 
and now it's popular. Now even guys that go through seminary, we have to learn Hebrew. And God so wanted me to learn it that I took it in one seminary, and I transferred seminaries, and they said, well, we're not going to accept that. You have to take Hebrew again. So I took Hebrew too many times. But they, we look at so these fulfillments of prophecy, and we have to look at a couple of other things. Ezekiel 34, 13 reads this, and I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land, and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the ravines and in the inhabited places of the country. Did you know that in August of 2018, that's just a month and a half ago, for the first time, the number of Jews in Israel passed the number of Jews in America. It is the biggest grouping of Jews in the world. This is the beginning, this is fulfillment of prophecy that God had talked about. I'm going to gather them together in Israel. And we're living in this time, and, and you might think, well, that's... Weird, I don't understand that. But get this. Donald Trump moved the, our embassy to Jerusalem. Now, you might think, well, that's not that big a deal. But did you know that Vladimir Putin had gone into Israel and said, wouldn't it be nice to build a third temple? You didn't know that, did you? Nobody, nobody, nobody cares about that stuff. But that's the full thing. Do you realize if you were with us several months ago, I talked about the, the um, pre-tribulation rapture, and I said one of the signs for, for us is that we got it wrong in being pre-tribulation rapture is if they start working on the third temple. They're talking about working on the third temple. Bill Deller is sweating because he doesn't like to be wrong. He's a pre-tribulation rapture guy. Some of y'all don't know what that means. That means, boom, you're gone, right? Jesus calls us home, and then he comes back, and we're on the other side of it, and he comes in like a roar, just a champion, and we're there, yeah, kill them all. <laughs> Not exactly. It's more the Dave Couch approach. Kill them all, Jesus! I see him hiding! <laughs> not really. Hopefully that's not what we're saying. But! It's <laughs> That's the sermon's over. Let's try this. I can't do my dance moves holding this. Oh, and this is going to be the last spot. How's that? Is that a better? Second Timothy, Paul writes, For the time is coming when the people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Prophecy is being fulfilled right as we speak. We can see this lived out in the, the church in the West specifically, because that's what I'm familiar with is the church in the West. We see this lived out. Did you know that the United States, the last statistic I found, we are the fourth largest nation of receiving missionaries. Did you know that? People that we sent missionaries to are sending missionaries to us and saying something's wrong in the United States. They're sending missionaries to us. Why? Because people have stopped enduring solid teaching. Because ultimately, solid teaching would, would reflect and identify that I need to submit myself and put my belief in God and allow Him to shape the desires of my heart. It's a lot easier for me to tell you, wouldn't you love to have your best life now? But the promise I have is you're going to have a life with Christ. It may not be all you think of, but God will change the desires of your heart and you will desire what He desires. And ultimately, that will lead you into an eternal presence with Christ. And it may not be what you think in this world. We don't want to hear that. I want to hear, let me get the boat. Let me get the car. Let me get the giant truck. Let me get the Harley. God, that's the desires of my heart. That's not what the Bible says. For us, I think it's important that we shape our lives and, and really build ourselves around what God has done and who He is. My faith in God or your faith in God shouldn't be contingent upon what He has said, or, or rather what He can provide you with. It should be on who He is. 
In the midst of that, our faith and loving, God will provide you with everything you need. But do you love him for who he is? What he's already provided, the grace and mercy he's poured out on you. The blood of Christ that you've been washed and you stand forgiven of your sins by his efforts, by his work. You see, God made this covenant with Abram, and God's the only one that's contingent on doing anything and upholding it. God has made a covenant from the, throughout the entirety of the Bible where He says, I'm going to save you, and it's on me. It's on my shoulders. I'm going to do it, because you can't. You see, and that's where we sit. God has accomplished that which He said. We're just waiting for the final chapter to close so we can watch Dave Couch ride in next to Jesus shouting, kill him. <laughs> Don't worry, we've got a fun set up for Dave's counseling <laughs> to deal with his anger issues. Be still and know that I am God, Dave. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, you're an amazing and gracious God. And we find ourselves in Spiritual times, even though as we look at the Bible, sometimes it seems like, boy, I wonder what it was like then. But to look at what's going on now and see what your hand is doing and, and the prophecies being fulfilled and the things going on all around us. And Lord, we don't know when you're coming back. We know you are. We trust in you. God, I pray that we would each have eyes to see and ears to hear what it is you're doing and a heart that willing to submit ourselves unto you. God, we know you are our safety net. You're not calling us into things that you're not going to be right there with us in. And Lord, that we can cling to you in the midst of turmoil. And God, I pray that you would just continue to speak into our lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if I don't see you before next week... Have a fantastic week. And don't forget, if you want to volunteer to clean or uh, do one of these other ministries, if you ever think, hey, I want to volunteer in a ministry, let us know. We'll get you set up in that. Have a great day.